Hi, good afternoon or good morning, depending on what uh, time of day you're doing this on. Um, but we are so thrilled to have Mike Muhammad with us. And he is just such an extraordinary high school physics teacher. And I want to have him introduce himself, but we're hoping to engage in a conversation around the habits of mind and how that significantly impacted his thinking and his work with his students um, in addition to uh, the continued development with NextGen. So take it away, Mike, good morning. Good morning, well, uh, my name is Mike Mohammed. I teach um, high school science, specifically now um, physics and AP physics in Brookfield, uh, Wisconsin at a high school, Brookfield Central High School. I've been there for um, 13 years and been teaching for 17 years now. Great. Right. So, Mike, let's start with how long you've done Habits of Mind, or how long have you began to engage in Habits of Mind in your science classroom? Yeah. So, really, um, about four years ago, I was, um, our district picked a handful of teachers and asked them to design their ideal learning environment. And it was almost like uh, given free reign to really rethink how we teach and how we want students to learn. And at that point, I kind of really got to the point where I felt like um, science practices or how we do science had been put under the table and we've been prioritizing content knowledge and being able to deliver content in a very standard test-based environment. And really one of my goals was to really flip that or switch that script and it was basically putting the doing first and the outcome or the end secondary. And then uh, after about a year or so of doing that, it was finally kind of brought to our attention that um, what we were doing across the district was moving closer to a, a model in which students were being put in the center of their learning. And that's when I first started learning about this idea of personalizing learning in terms of putting students at the center. And about two years ago, I finally kind of got more of a framework through the habits of mind of how to actually talk about this in more of a student-centered framework. And then as a district, when we started moving towards the next generation science standards, I started seeing those connections to how all standards were moving and that these were embedded within where I wanted students to go. And that was wonderful to see, as opposed to some of our state standards, which had been very content driven. So full disclosure, Mike and I have been hanging out for probably a couple of years now, all, only on um, Twitter. And mm -hmm. so there is, was such vitality in how he was thinking about it. That's when I also virtually introduced him to Ben Akalik as well. So we're, we're huge fans of how you're actually interested in engaging students, not just in the habits of mind, but meaningful inquiry and challenges. So can you talk a little bit about the, the approach that you have in relation to the types of tasks that you're designing for students? Yeah, it really starts from almost day one in our classroom where um, instead of starting out, okay, here's a lecture, here's some information that I'm gonna put upon you, we start day one with students creating um, an online portfolio in Google Sites. And the very first thing they do is start with the passions page where they okay. look a little bit about themselves and not thinking about in the framework of science, just thinking about yourself, where, what are your interests and what would you like to communicate with other people that define you as a person? And after that, then we actually start getting into the very first next day it's still not physics content it's what are you curious about we start out with a curiosity day where pick any question that you've been curious about and we want to give you some time to find some resources on it and just learn a little bit about it learn about online resources and then create a short video to present what you found out and share it to the rest of the class and we end up using flipgrid where they mm -hmm. post that short video and Can you give everyone us a Mike, can you give us a couple examples of one or two of those questions? 
Yeah, sure. So um, one of the questions that a student had asked is why or actually is chocolate poisonous for dogs? You know, students, mm -hmm. we have students who love their pets and have been hearing this and want to know, is this really true? And why is it true? And that's one of the questions. And another one is basically, um, why is the sky blue? Another one that a student had done. And then another one, um, a student was interested in finding out, okay, why do people find clowns scary? And the movie, that movie, it had just come yeah, out in yeah. the theaters <laughs> and like, yeah. it was just something that had been a box office hit for a while. And, and a student was interested in finding that out. So just going to online resources, finding out some information and finding a way to present it to the rest of the class. And again, like I said, we put these on Flipgrid, which is great because it's not a matter of taking time to have every student stand in front of the class present, but then also students can comment on it as well. So it wasn't just a presentation and then done. There was a dialogue that was created as well. So it's really interesting as I'm listening to you, Mike, because oh, this is Benna, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm interested in it because what I hear you saying is that you were shifting from a text-based kind, a test, T-E-S-T -E based mm -hmm. kind of classroom to a process-oriented classroom in which the test might be an outcome of a demonstration of their knowledge, mm -hmm. but that you really were putting a lot of attention to having them engage in process. However, I have often heard from teachers that students, when you put them in the center like this, when they're used to, like, what's the right answer? How do I get an A in this class? That they basically get a little resistant and don't want to do the work of how you have to do the kinds of things like process. So I love the idea that you began with process, not with content, to give them some of the habits that you, I know you're heading toward like questioning and posing problems. So here you're asking them, use your curiosity and what are the kinds of questions you have? And then also getting them to know how to use Flipgrid, how to know how to use the uh, resources, how to do more research. So in a matter of what you've talked about, which is approximately two or three days, you've really introduced them to a student-centered classroom in a very exciting way. Yeah, I, I think there's so many tools that are out there. And if we do expect students to, okay, present and communicate in these alternative modes, they have to be introduced to those before mm -hmm. we can say, okay, here's 10 things, go do it. Um, they have to learn, okay, just get a little experience with each one and see what is this? Uh, is it something that's fun for me to create with? Is it a good way for me to communicate my voice and what I found out? And the more tools they, they see, the more they can choose from, but it's not just giving them a list of tools and assuming that they've actually investigated with them. Very important so, point. Yeah, and I, and I also wanna think about for a moment with you, um, you do this both as a, a physics teacher, but also as an AP physics class. Yeah. Can you talk about um, the pressures of integrating the same approach in an advanced placement program? Yeah, I think, you know, like you, like it's been stated before, you have a lot of students who are really concerned about that grade, that A, that uh, I don't want to get that B plus. I, I really, what do I need to do to get that A? And once you kind of get that fear out of the way and basically say, okay, we're going to be doing science and the idea that when we eventually have an assessment, it's not going to be one and done. I'm concerned about your learning that you'll have an opportunity to make up any failures, that's a huge deal. Um, once they know that and they have that fear assuaged because there's so much pressure for them to achieve, once that's out of the way and you're saying, okay, you will have a chance if that is your um, primal fear of getting that A, let's put that aside because if you show me the learning and you go through this process, that can be a possible outcome. So talk to, talk to us a little bit about your approach in terms of grading and reporting then. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're trying to get the anxiety or the pressure out of the way when it comes to students that are very focused on the mark, how do you create an experience where um, they have an opportunity to engage in deep thinking, but also um, be able to provide what it is that they're trying to aspire to. Yeah, 
I think the idea of we may call something a summative assessment, but it's still not over until the student decides it's over and me as a teacher we it's basically a communicative process the idea of these digital tools we have now the possibility of giving feedback on something like that's not necessarily test based like a project or a report the idea that they can submit something digitally i can make comments on it and we have a rubric that we're aligning to and letting them know okay here are some weak points and having them revise and resubmit that this assessment is in draft state. Okay. It's always in draft state until we are comfortable with it. Same thing with tests as well. Um, if for students in the AP curriculum, it, for those that are taking the test, and what's interesting is that number is going down. I had about 60 AP Physics 2 students, only about half of them actually took the test, <laughs> uh, the AP yeah. test. And that's one of those things that made me realize, well, I'm just spending all this time preparing these students for a test and half of them aren't taking it. What's the ultimate goal here? So yeah. that's one of the things that led me to kind of realize, all right, we do need to change the way we're doing this AP curriculum because we really aren't doing um, a service to those students who aren't going to be taking the test. So giving them alternative ways to demonstrate that mastery. But on that test side, letting them know that you're going to be taking a test for those who are taking it, going to be taking it in May, and we want to prepare you for that test, and that's the okay. ultimate goal. So still giving those opportunities for um, corrections and then ultimately reteaching and retesting. That is really, if like I said, the ultimate goal is to get that credit in May for those students. This is still a work in progress. We call it a test. You're taking a test on maybe Friday or sometime at the end of the year, but still uh, a process where we have to work on your communication skills and a free response question or something like that. Well, I, I love the idea too that everything is in draft phase. So mm -hmm. it really honors going back to the, the notion of the habits is that we're all a work in progress in our um, capacity, not just in the content territory, but in um, the dispositions as well. So go ahead, Benna. I was just thinking that really in a way, you're, you're, um, you have a classroom in which you have a two-tiered approach, so to speak, mm -hmm. because you're, you're doing all the things that encourage and foster them to think like scientists and to behave like scientists, while at the same time, you're giving them enough test prep that they can get through the gatekeeping if they want to. Yes. And then you're giving them the choice as to whether they commit to that or not. So it's a, it's a wonderfully uh, complex uh, kind of arrangement you have with the students that gives them a psychological safety, uh, safety and security while they're actually jumping into the doing. So mm -hmm. can you talk with us a little bit about um, how you've been using the habits of mind as you are helping them to make that transition? How do you get them to think about those habits? You know, well, I have to give some credit. Um, like I said, on the, one of the very first days, one of the things that we do is something called, it comes from this uh, program called Destination Imagination. Um, yeah. we do these things called instant challenges. In my, in my physics class, I, I have a couple of sections of co-taught physics, in which a third of the students have identified IEPs, and I have a co-teacher in that class who is uh, a, a Destination Imagination coach, and her name's and Andalia Espinosa, and she brought this idea of doing these instant challenges with students where there are five to 10 minute little challenges that we do and where we randomly group the students and they're given five minutes with a task. They, have, they don't have any um, prior knowledge about this task. It's all right, take these everyday materials and do something with them, thinking about these materials differently. And it helps put them in different groups, people they're not used to working with, having to communicate and actually have to problem solve on a small, uh, on a short-term basis and thinking about things differently. And it really hits so many of the habits of mind. And without uh, that high, um, high stress graded practice thing where they can start thinking about, all right, how are we gonna do this, being able to communicate with each other and really think as a group what we need to do and really like we talk about think flexibly i think that's just you've got this 
these materials that wouldn't be used to ever build a bridge, but how would you build a bridge? How would you build a structure? What do these things do? And thinking about things completely differently than our normal uses of them. Do you name the habits at that time? <coughs> um, we do not name them at that time, but we will kind of use them more all right and throw them in there. As we get closer to our passion project, that's when we start actually using them more intentionally and actually naming them. I think Andy does, Andy Lee does a good job of when we reflect at the end of the challenge, she'll throw the pepper them in to get them to start thinking about these terms. But it's not until we actually probably get into the lab or get into um, the actual standards themselves that we start pulling out those ideas. And when you pull them out, are they pulled out by you as the teacher and or with the students? It's pulled out basically by me and communicated to the students. So I, I love the idea that you're starting to get them immersed in the habits of mind. Mm -hmm. How are you giving them feedback on their um, work with the habits of mind in relation to the content? You know, it's really interesting because as I've been looking at the science standards. I see how they're embedded in there, but it's really, honestly, it's really interesting. I think the, the written feedback doesn't hit the habits of, mind, habits of mind as much as the conversations we have uh, when students are stuck yes. or asking questions. It's those communications, those conversations where you can mm -hmm. actually bring up a habit of mind and talk to them in those term in that terminology where you're basically dropping these the phrasings of the habits of mind because they flow so conversationally in mm -hmm. terms of what we're talking about so can whether you, can you give us a concrete example mike yeah so basically uh, i think really i like when we're talking about uh, i just think that instant challenge is a great one or when we're doing a maker challenge just thinking about when they um, hit a roadblock and are so concrete about what they think they should be doing or looking at someone else's answer, having mm -hmm. them think a little bit differently or think a little bit more flexibly or, you know, when they hit um, a place where they haven't really done the great job of measuring or designing a procedure Sometimes I'm looking for them to use the right tool to actually collect data and that's where I can pull in something like striving for accuracy in your data. All right, is this really the best tool to do your measurements with? Are we gonna be able to collect the best data? And when we get to something like a passion project, we spend days coming up with their actual question they're looking to solve. Or even what questions are you interested in? Is this a deep enough question is this going to lead to just a yes or no answer or is this really a deep question that interests you and have you thought about when we're doing experimental design have you thought about looking at independent and dependent variables and phrasing your question appropriately hmm. so when students have to uh, reflect back on who they are as learners and be mm -hmm. able to promote themselves in their resumes and their college apps and things like that would they be able to say, do you think, that um, what was really important in my uh, learning was that, especially in my science class, was that I learned how to ask questions and pose problems that I could research and develop? Or would that language not be the language that they might use? You know, I think they would definitely be able to pull those out. You know, the idea of when you talk about thinking like a scientist, when we talk about a scientist, we're able to pull a bunch of these terms directly out of there. And especially the teamwork things, the be able to think as a team, think interdependently, you know, things like that are still things that we do talk about on a classroom basis and advocate for. So it's language that they would be familiar with? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, that's great. And so my question is, uh, well, well, twofold. One is I wanted to just say that uh, on our website, both on Learning Personalized as well as on the Habits of Mind Institute, we have the article that Art and I wrote on the 16 habits. And you're welcome to use that to give to the students so that they can actually read it and think about it. So I just invite you to do that. The students in your uh, high school 
physics class should mm -hmm. be perfectly able to read. It's a short article, but it gives them a little depth of the understanding of what the habits are. So oh. use it any way you'd like. Thank you. <laughs> Love to do that. <laughs> and if you have any problem finding it, just I'll, I'll send you a copy of it just to make sure you get it. All right. Fantastic. And, and also, um, the, the question I wanted was to ask you about, you now are faced with uh, yet another version of standards. Mm -hmm. So NGSS is now really big. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you started to shift to plan for uh, using that framework and, you know, just your, your beautiful chart that you've designed, <laughs> just, just how you were thinking about that? Yeah, well, you know, last um, summer, we were basically told as a district, and actually as a state, Wisconsin adopted the next generation science standards in a framework. They've slightly tweaked some of the wording, um, but really it's a matter of once I started looking at uh, the standards, they really do focus on a practice, the science practices in addition to some content and some overarching themes. But the fact that they're really practice-based made me realize that, um, and I started reading over them, I'm like, oh, these are students, are asking students to do things, not just individually, but as groups, which is really great to see. And then also this idea of problem posing, striving mm. for accuracy. I just saw such a great connection between those habits of mind that were are actually just embedded within the language of these science practices. And I couldn't help but want to find those connections so that students didn't see, or actually other science teachers or other teachers didn't just see these habits of mind as being an afterthought, that they are embedded in the practices of a scientist. And I haven't spent much time looking at um, social studies or the common core English and math standards but I imagine if I spent time digging in those they would just be embedded in those as well yeah. and let's not have them be an afterthought let's make them intentional and realize that they're intentional and they're a great way to communicate with students and give them feedback I think like I said conversationally is the way you were really going to hit them because yeah. they can hear the words coming out of our mouth and letting them guide and lead our conversations it's wonderful wonderful uh, the, the aspect of it that I was uh, pointing to when I said that maybe they need to also be able to say from their own perspective how they use the habits and have that language. I love the idea that it's embedded in conversational. Mm -hmm. I also think that one of the things that we've learned is that if they also recognize that language themselves as they're thinking and doing and they can ref reflect on it and say something, and I'm not suggesting having a reflection all the time, that's not necessary, mm -hmm. but something that helps them so that they see the benefit of it. Because it's, the question is not just when you use the habit, it's when you don't use the habit and what happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of if I'm in a group and I'm trying to be thinking interdependently, but I'm not able to listen with understanding and empathy, I'm probably not gonna be influenced by what anybody else is saying. So yes. then it kind of comes back to me, oh, you know, there would have been a benefit if I had really listened more yeah. closely. So it's that kind of relationship of the habit and its benefit that students can then claim when they're doing their applications, their resumes, they're thinking about their future. Yeah. And, and as um, Ben and, and Mike have been talking, I think the, the connection uh, to the standards is not only significant in next gen, but very clear in um, documents like C3 and Common Core and um, the new ACTFL standards. So really trying to think about and paying attention to how can we, and I'm gonna echo your words, Mike, not treat it as an afterthought. I think that may, made Ben and my heart go a flutter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that you're not just layering on something else in addition to an already overloaded um, curriculum and pacing guide, but really starting to think about what can we do to make sure that the assignments that we're engaging students in are thoughtful, meaningful, and intentional, as well as being aligned with the standards. So, 
And Mike, we're thrilled that um, you're giving folks access to the example that you shared with us mm -hmm. on how the next generation science standards are linked, not just to the habits, but how you're starting to imagine it through the lens of the kinds of tasks or experiences that you're not just engaging in a physics classroom, but it could very easily be used across all sciences and all grade levels. Right. You know, and just thinking, I know I, I'm just having a brainstorm here. Um, one thing I usually do that I've been doing for a while with my students with our portfolios is, and especially brought it to the forefront this year, is they um, provide evidence for each of the science practices as um, part of their portfolio. And I think it would be really great now that um, kind of making that connection between the habits of mind and each of the standards, I think it would be great to include the habits of mind as part of that discussion as students do that reflection. And even thinking about maybe how they've grown or even at the beginning of the year, all right, having them do just a little bit of an analysis of what, like you said, Ben, you're, you're allowing us to share that article and it's very student friendly, have them read it over and just why don't you just think for a minute, what are your strengths and what are your challenges in terms of habits of mind? And maybe is there one we could focus on, one mm -hmm. that we could progress and look at how you could grow and how we could help you grow with that, maybe as a dialogue. Because once we start looking at these, not just being in the science classroom, but really being a habit of mind for life, then it's like, oh, okay, this is not just essential for these two terms of physics that I'm taking that maybe when I walk out the door, maybe this is something that I see is a definite connection to the rest of my life. Well, that really makes our hearts sing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, thank you so much for having the conversation with us. And again, there'll be a couple of materials that are going to be linked to this landing page. And again, definitely um, hang out with Mike on Twitter, just like me. <laughs> just like I'm gonna, yeah. gonna follow him as well. Um, yep. And again, He's just doing such wonderful things. So appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the time and the inspiration, of course. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we're back on. Ben, no, I'm